Today we're going to talk about Baroque ceiling paintings, and these will be illusionistic frescoes, uh, where when you look up, it looks like you're looking up into the sky or to the heaven. The first artist we're going to talk about is Anibala Caracci. Now, he comes from a family of painters. His brother, Agostino, and his cousin, Ludovico, also are very famous artists from Bologna in Italy. He exemplifies the classical Baroque. And what Caracci wanted to do was to get away from mannerism, you know, rejecting mannerism, and use the high Renaissance idealism, but make it more lifelike, uh, perhaps a bit more dramatic. And so we call that classical Baroque. One of the things the Karachis did was found an art academy. And they had a really interesting idea that you could teach art in a school, an academic setting, rather than as apprenticing in a craft. So all of you who are studio art majors getting your degree in art or studio art, thank the Karachi. They had certain principles that the artists were supposed to learn in their school, and some of these we still use today. Um, they wanted the students to observe life. And this might involve, you know, obviously, having a life model or going out and uh, drawing uh, outside the studio. They also thought that you should learn from past art. So people would draw from casts of famous classical statues or uh, copy uh, Renaissance works of art that were available to them. And we'll still sometimes do many of these things. Of course, we still have life drawing classes. And sometimes a professor will send you out to observe life, to draw from uh, the surroundings. And uh, sometimes you'll have an assignment that deals with past art, perhaps recreating it or taking from it some, a certain kind of lesson. The work that we're going to talk about by Karachi, and uh, his brother did uh, assist in this, but we're not gonna break it up for you uh, for the survey class. Uh, the work that we're going to talk about uh, by Karachi is the Farnese Gallery Ceiling in the Farnese Palace, the Palazzo Farnese in Rome. Uh, this, of course, was the uh, home of the Farnese family, very wealthy and powerful family. Uh, today, I understand it is the French uh, embassy, so it's not a museum that you can go in and look at. Um, a good date for this is uh, circa 1600, because as you can see, uh, he was working on it a little bit at the end of the uh, 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century, 1597 to 1601. So just circa, C period, uh, 1600. The subject matter were the loves of the classical gods. So what we have are classical mythological subjects. And it is an illusionistic ceiling fresco in a very special way. And we're going to see how that works. Now, if you look at some of the individual scenes, uh, you may notice that there seems to be quite a bit of movement. Uh, there are diagonals. Uh, in the composition of how the figures are coming in or how they're leaning, and that adds a bit of drama to it. The central section in the ceiling is called the Triumph of Bacchus and Ariadne. And, uh, you know, it looks like everybody's having a good time. They're making music, they're processing, uh, and of course there's exotic touches, uh, such as the, uh, the uh, such as the tigers or the panthers, perhaps. I want to show you another uh, single image uh, to get you an idea of the style of this. And this one is Mercury bringing the golden apple to Paris. Uh, the golden apple was the prize for the most beautiful goddess. And uh, the king of the gods, Zeus or Jupiter, was not going to be the judge. He was going to pass it on to a mere mortal, to Paris, who is a Trojan prince, but right now he doesn't know it. He is uh, acting as a shepherd. And so the messenger god Mercury brings him the golden apple, and uh, Paris makes his decision 
uh, based on uh, a bribe. Uh, Venus, the goddess of love, tells Paris that if he chooses her, she will give him the most beautiful woman in the world as his wife. Of course, the most beautiful woman, Helen, is already married. So it is an allusion to uh, not exactly the loves of the gods, uh, but the complications that love can bring, because the complication for Paris was the Trojan War and the destruction of his city and his country. Now, what I wanted you to notice was how the figures are forming these dramatic diagonals and how you're kind of looking up under them. Uh, Mercury is flying in on a, a very dramatic diagonal, very much foreshortened. And uh, we're looking up underneath Paris and he has this long shepherd's staff that carries on that vertical movement that parallels uh, the uh, posture of Mercury. So that's more dramatic. The figures also are quite robust. Uh, these are, are muscular figures. Uh, and of course, you can see that the draperies are uh, somewhat billowing out. Which makes it more dramatic. Now, the Farnese ceiling was influenced by Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling in several ways. For example, the ignudi or the decorative male nudes are present in both and both also employ illusionistic sculpture. So let's take a look. Here we have Caracci's Farnese gallery ceiling. And here we have Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. Now one is secular, uh, and of course Michelangelo's is in uh, the papal chapel, so it, it has uh, religious themes, sacred themes. Uh, but there are some similarities. Uh, they are both divided into sections. Uh, they have scenes going down the center and then scenes that are uh, in the barrel of the vault, uh, sort of the side of the vault. And they're both on a, a barrel or tunnel vault. Uh, they're both frescoes and they both have a certain amount of illusionism. So let's look at it in detail. Here we have a detail of Caracci's uh, Farnese ceiling. And you can see that you have these uh, ignudi, the uh, decorative nudes, which we also see in Michelangelo, and that there is a uh, round relief sculpture painted. It's painted, it's not really sculpture. Uh, and that's a kind of quotation or an allusion to Michelangelo because he employs uh, the same motif. Uh, there's even more sculpture with the Karachi. Uh, he has uh, these uh, terms or terms, these sort of uh, half figure sculpture uh, that then end in a, uh, a tapering block. And as you can see, there's a lot of decoration and there's some uh, putti and there's a, even a grotesque head below and fruits and flowers rather than the acorns, which of course, uh, for Michelangelo, these are the emblem of the Pope's family. So uh, we don't need the acorns for Karachi. And here we see the he's here we see a close up of the ignudi. Um, both artists are uh, interested in finding all sorts of different poses for the human body. One thing you may notice about Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling uh, is that the scenes that go down the center do not look like you're looking up. The ignudi look like you're looking up beneath them, but here the center scene in this case the creation of Eve. Uh, simply looks like it would be a painting that could fit on a wall. So we're going to come back to that point. And I want to show you uh, another detail, just so you have some idea. This is a scene of Venus and Anchises, who is the father of Aeneas. And uh, of course, Venus is the uh, mother of Aeneas. And you can see them uh, just before they get around to conceiving uh, the great hero, Aeneas. Uh, it certainly is an example of the loves or maybe the lusts of the classical gods. Uh, the pose with the uh, crossed legs uh, is uh, considered to be a very erotic pose. And I have to admit, I have never before seen a uh, putti, a little cupid here, uh, 
who has such a lascivious look on his face. Now, one of the things I think that is very important, and this is, this is a major point, that the Farnese ceiling is in some way a critique of Michelangelo's illusionism. You'll remember that Michelangelo's central scenes running down the center of the ceiling appear as though they were straight on the wall. And Karachi feels that this is not a complete illusion. You know, that he's, he's critiquing, essentially, Michelangelo's illusionism with his own illusion. Now, with Karachi's ceiling, the scenes going down the center also look like they're straight on. But what he does is account for that. He paints frames around the individual scenes. The illusion that Karachi creates is that someone's hung paintings on the ceiling, and that's why they look straight on. So he accounts for that, and it is the illusion that these are all framed paintings hanging on the ceiling or propped up against the uh, rising of the vault, uh, overlapping sometimes with the roundels and the sculpture. But of course, it's all fresco. And here you see another example of that. So what Karachi is doing is breaking down the barriers between reality and art. He wants you to look up there and think that there are paintings up against the ceiling, hung on the ceiling, as it were. The effect of making the viewer believe that the painted image is physically present, that it's real. It's called trompe l'oeil, or fool the eye. It's French for fool the eye. So Karachi wants to fool your eye into believing uh, that those paintings are really hanging on the ceiling. Well then, Baroque illusionism goes much further. And they create an illusion that as you're looking up, you're seeing clouds, angels, uh, mythological figures, whatever the subject is, above your head. And they're all flying or hovering up there. In other words, the illusion is that the top of the room opens directly up to heaven or the sky. And the figures are foreshortened, so we're looking up from under. And there is an Italian term, which I want you to know, to, that describes this uh, type of illusionism. It's called di soto in su, di soto in su, uh, looking up from under. And this is the term we use uh, when we're talking about this Baroque illusionism, where you have the sense of infinite space, you know, the ceiling's just opening up, and uh, all of these figures are flying or hovering overhead, uh, and we're seeing them pretty much from the underside. I'm going to show you two. Uh, one is secular and one is sacred. One is in a palazzo, a palace, uh, the Barberini Palace in Rome. And it is by uh, the uh, artist Pietro da Cotorno, which just means Peter from Cotorno, which is a city in Italy. And it's called, the short title is The Triumph of the Barberini. Uh, and uh, your text now has a much longer title, The Glorification of the Papacy of Urban VIII. Well, in a way, they're kind of the same thing because Urban VIII was a, the Barberini Pope. So um, what we're seeing here is this illusionistic ceiling with de Soto in Su. Now, the figures that we're seeing are either classical mythological figures or uh, allegories. And they are supposed to represent the Barberini virtues uh, that overcome vice. And here I wanted to show you this detail. And this is where you really uh, see right up in the center uh, the reference to Urban VIII. Uh, as you can see, there are these flying figures, uh, allegorical figures, angels, whatever they may be, uh, flying figures holding giant 
papal keys. Remember, uh, Christ says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And that is the Bible verse uh, that the popes rely on uh, for their authority. They said the, the uh, authority, uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, were given to Peter. He was the first pope. He was the bishop of Rome. And that power is passed on to subsequent popes, according, of course, to the papacy. Um, and then up above the, the, um, up above the keys, we see another flying figure holding up the papal tiara uh, with radiant light coming from it. And we're seeing it from below. Uh, then look down a little bit. Here, right in the center of this detail, you see three giant bees with uh, figures holding a kind of wreath around them. Now, what are those bees doing there? Well, the bees are the family emblem, like the acorns were for Pope Julius II's family, uh, the Della Rovera. The Barberini bees are the emblem for the Barberini family, and you will find them all over Rome on artwork. Uh, I remember the way I found the Barberini Palace one time as I'm walking down the street and I see uh, on the sort of gatepost, the Barberini bees. Ah, it must be the Barberini Palace. Or I'm walking around and I see sculpture that has uh, the Barberini bees. You'll find them, for example, on Bernini's Baldacchino over the um, high altar at, uh, over the high altar in St. Peter's. Uh, so they're uh, pretty frequently seen. Uh, Urban VIII was a pretty good art patron. Now we're going to look at one of these Baroque ceiling paintings that is actually in a church. It's in the church of Il Gesù in Rome, and Il Gesù means Jesus. It's the church of Jesus in Rome, and it is a, a Jesuit church. Uh, the Jesuits have a particular devotion to the name of Jesus. And so this uh, ceiling is the subject of the ceiling was called is the triumph of the name of Jesus and the artist is Giovanni Battista Galli. Now this particular church was supposed to have a relic uh, that is believed to be the foreskin of Christ and of course this ties into the naming uh, the idea that at the circumcision uh, Jesus would have received his name just as uh, in a Christian uh, family, the child receives his name at uh, christening or baptism. Something you can't see in reproductions, but you see that glow of light right there in the center. Uh, the Jesuits are a counter-reformation order. Uh, they came into being at the time of the counter-reformation, and they have this particular devotion to the name of Jesus. You'll notice that the fresco itself is in an oval, and we talked before about the oval being this uh, sort of a dramatic circle, as though a circle had length and movement, that it was stretched out. Uh, and so uh, it's a Baroque shape in a sense. It was used for uh, the plan of San Carlo alla Quattro Fontone, sort of a undulating oval. Uh, and we saw how the oval was also used as uh, the Piazza San Pietro. Uh, by Bernini. Well, here it is in paint. Uh, you have a kind of oval frame. You'll notice that the figures are breaking across the framing, though, and they literally have stucco, uh, sculptured angels in plaster, uh, who are you know, hoovering up here so that uh, we're breaking the barriers, essentially. And when we look up through this oval, it looks as though we're looking up to heaven. Uh, it's just the space just goes up and up and up. It's just infinite space. Uh, it's a perfect example of the illusionistic ceiling painting. Uh, and uh, De Soto in Su. Uh, all the figures uh, look as though uh, they have been foreshortened. They're sitting on clouds. Uh, and we are below them. Now, I said that the Jesuits have a particular devotion to the name of Jesus. And something that you really can't see in reproductions is within the aureole of light that you see here. You see this aureole of light and all of the angels surrounding it. But right in the middle is the IHS, which is the monogram 
of Jesus, of Christ. And so the holy name of Jesus is being adored by the angels. But some of the angels uh, aren't adoring the name of Jesus. And you may remember the story that devils are fallen angels. So here the angels who uh, have chosen evil fall away from the sacred name of Jesus. And you can see them here. They've, the uh, image is, is uh, breaking through the barriers of the frame and hovering overhead. And this is the entrance where you come in and you look up and it looks like the fallen angels are going to fall down on your head. They're going to tumble down on you. So the fallen angels are falling away from the sacred name of Jesus. And you're looking up and you're seeing them overhead. And what do you, sh what should you do? So once again, Baroque illusionism is trying to fool you. It's trying to break down the barriers between reality and art. And uh, you're supposed to think those angels, those fallen angels, those devils are really coming down on your head.